laughing, everyone. <laughs> Sorry. How's it going? Oh. I'm sleepy. I didn't sleep good last night. I'm sleepy. Everybody's like, why are you mad? I'm like, I'm not mad. I'm just tired. It's all good in the hood. How's everybody's Christmas? Did you enjoy yourself? Yes? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was a lot. We had a good time, though. I know. Ellie opened one present, and then she was done. She just wanted that one. Th she wanted the doll, and that was it. She didn't want nothing else. I'm like, we have a whole lot more stuff to open. She didn't care about none of it. All she wanted was her doll. So that was all good. But we slowly, hours later, oh, God, for everything. But anyways, it was super nice. And so, did you? Oh, I thought he pissed me. <laughs> um, so I, we need to uh, pray for uh, Candy, uh, Christina and Gilbert's daughter. She's having her baby today. Um, she's been in the hospital. She's she was pre, she had pre eclamps pre eclampsia. Sorry, I'll spit it, I'll spit it out. I'll spit it out. Give me a second. Uh, anyway, so the, uh, yesterday she had texted me because her blood pressure was up really high. They didn't know what they were going to do, so they decided this morning early that they're going to go ahead and take the baby. She's 34 weeks, right? Yeah, I think so. So, anyways, so she's little Breeze, her name. So Breeze going to be born today. So pray for Roger. I mean Roger. Gilbert and Christina, Lord have mercy. My brain, do you see it? The wheels are turning and the, and the little snapses are trying to join themselves together. Uh, anyway, so uh, pray for them, and we, are, we will corporately in just a second. And, so, and then pray for my son and my husband because they're doing firework stands. Lord have mercy. We did one in July, and I was okay with that. And he said, we're going to do two next July. I was like, oh, okay. And then somehow we ended up doing two for New Year's. So anyways, so... Y'all pray for us because that drives me crazy anyways. so I did Nolanville. I sat in Nolanville. My, my son, I got there. He was all by himself with all the boxes all around him. And he's like, I don't know what I'm doing. I was like, apparently. Because you've been here for a couple hours and nothing. Is, a couple things are unpacked and, like, just kind of sitting out. He's like, what's a novelty item? I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to be here all day. So, anyways, I was. Uh, so, anyways, but y'all go buy some fireworks. It's amazing. Yeah. The new stand over here in Belton, though, it's, it's nice. It's much bigger, so we have a lot more stuff. Anyways, it's kind of fun, though. I was, you know how God is. I was kind of grumpy, like, you know, and then me, like, I would be complaining never in a million years, right? So, anyways, I was winding it. We weren't quite done setting up, and this car pulls up, and I, I see the lady. I'm like, oh, I remember you. I totally remember this chick. And she walked up, and she's like, are y'all ready to sell? I was like, we will for you. And I was laughing. Anyway, she she, we had like this whole conversation. I remembered her. She remembered me. I remember what she bought and she bought a bunch of you know, new stuff. And I was like, I didn't realize, you know, like the impact some of those people had in my life because I remembered them. You know what I mean? Like and we had this total fun conversation. And so anyways, the Lord said, shut up, just make some friends and be happy. I was like, yes, sir, I will do so. So that's exactly what my attitude was the rest of the day. So, but now I'm amongst friends. So anyways, I'm super excited about today. It's our last service of this decade. How crazy is that? I got so tickled the other day, though. My son, he's like the ultimate salesman, I swear. I, I don't know where he came from. He did not come from my womb because he's such a people person. And anyway, so he was like, so this guy was buying stuff, and my son said, he goes, look, dude, it's not just New Year. It's the end of the decade. You better go out big. And then the guy bought like $100 more worth of stuff, and I was looking at him. I'm like, who are you? So anyways, he's like totally suckering all these people to buy everything. So don't go see him if you don't want to buy fireworks because he will make you buy them. So, <laughs> so anyways, I thought that's true. It's the end of the decade. You don't think about that every day. Who thought when you were little you'd be alive in 2020? I was cutting out dolls out of Sears Roebuck's catalog, never thinking I'd make it to 2020. You know what I mean? So <laughs> and now here we are. So that God's got amazing things planned for us. And so I have been like kind of contemplating what it is that we were supposed to do today. And then God like gave me a whole... Um, download yesterday while I was selling, and uh, then he woke me up every hour on the hour uh, last night to drop little things inside of my heart for all of us today. So we're going to go out with the bang ourselves. Amen. So let's stand up. Let's get ready to worship Jesus. Is it hot in here or is it just me? Wow. That was an overwhelming, it's just you. Oh, wow. Must be all that cedar in my body trying to make me crazy. It's horrible out there. It's cool. Nothing but cedar trees right there. Who else is dealing with allergies, by the way? 
telling you, I haven't had, I had a serious allergy attack yesterday. I haven't had one of those in a very long time. So we're going to lift up uh, uh, Candy and her new baby and uh, Christina and Gilbert, and we're going to pray for all you people with allergies. Amen. We're all going to get over this. I'm, I ain't doing it. Amen. So let's lift our hands. Father, we just thank you for this day. We just ask right now for your spirit just to blow a refreshing wind over Candy and over baby Bree. Father, we just thank you for an easy delivery. We thank you, Father God, for no complications. We thank you that new life is being birthed this day. We just rejoice with you uh, as you just bring this uh, new bundle of joy into their lives. We just pray for Gilbert and Christina as they travel, that their travel mercies are there. There's no accidents. There's no complications in the way. And Father, we declare healing over everyone who's suffering with allergies right now. Father, we just ask that you would give us an inoculation shot right now spiritually that we'd be able to combat the things that are in the air because we were made for we were made for praising we were made for worshiping you we don't want anything to interfere with that father so no itchy no cloggy noses no itchy eyes none of that stuff father we just ask you for your healing virtue to just to come over especially lauren father we just ask for a miracle over her right now in jesus name Father, we just worship you right now. We come together corporately just to say we love you. And we ask that as we give our hearts and worship to you, that you would just fill us with your presence today, that you would overwhelm us with your goodness, God. And we just worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just go worship Jesus. Amen. Oh, hey, oh, hey. 
Come on, because you're mighty. Because you are mighty. We say you are mighty. And the whole earth sings your praise. The whole earth. Come on, tell them again you're holy. Because you are holy. We say you are holy. And the whole earth sings your praise. The whole earth. your 
holding nothing back. you in the middle of my mess but you had been there all along open your arms and open your heart and call me in you didn't hesitate at all and the lies that were believed they crumble at the weight of your truth and the fear that gripped my heart is arrested so that I can see you cause when I only see prophesy your promise I believe you God cause you finish what you saw I will trust you in the process I believe you God you set a table in the middle of my of it all and what I faced looked like it would never end you said watch the giants fall come on sing this again you set a table you set a table in the middle of my war you knew the outcome of it all When what I faced looked like it would never end. You said, watch the giants fall. Come on, the lies. And the lies I was believed, they crumbled at the weight of your truth.
is resting so that I can see you. Come on, sing that again. And the lies. And the lies that once believed, they crumble at the weight of your truth. Say this again, and the lies I once believed, and the lies I once believed, they crumble at the weight of your truth, and the fear that gripped my heart is arrested. One more time in the lies. And the lies I once believed, they crumble, they crumble. you finish what you start, I will trust you in the process, I believe you, God. Come on, do that again, when I only see, when I only see in part, I will prophesy your promise, I believe. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance for your glory, Lord. We will lift up a shout to adore you. Every sound that we make it is for you. We will dance for your glory, Lord. Come on, do it again. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance for your glory, Lord. We lift, we lift up a shout to adore you. Every sound that we make, it is for you. We will dance for your glory, Lord. Salvation for salvation.
Hallelujah. Amen. God is so good. And she was about to bust into that, and I can tell you right now, I ain't a, not, not a one person ready for any of that right now. I love you. I love you. But no, there's not a heart ready for that. <laughs> but we're going to get ready for it. Amen. So we're going to transition right now, and then we're going to have a little moment. We're going to, I'm going to prophesy some things to you. We're going to have communion as a corporate body, and then we're going to go back into this. Amen? We're going to get our hearts ready for it. So Jesus, come on, lift your hands. Hallelujah. I love you guys. You know I say that all with love, right? If you want the crap year that you had to go away and for a new one to come and usher in uh, some goodness of God in your life and some promises of God, our hearts need to be prepared. And so, Father, we ask you right now to prepare our hearts for your goodness. Oh, Jesus. I break off the spirit of lethargy in the name of Jesus. I break off disappointment. I break off discouragement. I say that the battles that you fought in 2019, they are hurled off of your back and you will not carry them in to this next season. Jesus, I cry for awakening this morning. But the spirit of revival and awakening awaken every heart that is here today, every heart that is here, regardless of whether or not they want it, I pray and declare the spirit of awakening and the spirit of revival. Ooh, Jesus. Ha. Jesus. I'm telling you what. We do not fight flesh and blood. But we fight spiritual warfare. We have spiritual warfare, spiritual wickedness in high places. And that is what is hurling over your heart right now to cause you to stop to be able to enter into what God has for you this morning. And I just right now, by the Spirit of God, begin to move away all of that demonic activity. I shoo it away like Abraham shooed away the, the birds that would try to come and try to devour the covenant sacrifice that he brought before the Lord. I say you're not welcome here. Jesus, Jesus. The devil is a liar. Jesus. We just lift up your truth this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> I declare the harvest of joy. The harvest of joy, the harvest of joy over every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you need to smile. Don't fake it. Smile because you are alive and breathing and God has blessed you. And tell somebody else how glad you are to see them and hug their neck. Tell them that you love them. And then we're going to get back into this. Amen. I love you. good. No, you're fine. It didn't matter. <laughs> Amen. I'm still so hot. need. Sorry, my husband just, he must be watching online. Hi, honey, I love you. I miss you. Ooh. All right. Sorry. I had six messages from my husband. That's why I don't look at my phone during service. Amen. All right. Well, I guess let's do offering real fast. And then we're going to do tithes and offerings. And we're going to have an opportunity later when we get it in. Y'all ready? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Still part of worship. Amen. Yeah. Worship is giving. Father, we just thank you for the... Uh, unbelievable provision that you've given to us, Father. Even when we think we have little, we are still immensely blessed. And so, Father, as we just um, give back to you and your kingdom, uh, we just thank you for the seed that you've allowed us to sow. And I just ask that it would be a, um, 
just a fruitful blessing to those who are um, obedient to give according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If y'all are giving online, I know some of you, here, put that one. Some of you um, track your giving, so remember, you can give to the 31st if you, for your tax deductions if you're concerned about that. God is so good. I'm tired, but I'm excited. I don't think I'm going to need this one. weren't here. We have some visitors. Thank you guys for coming. Come next week and the whole other half of our church will be here. Actually, you'll be gone though and you'll be gone next week. So if we could all get to church one weekend, we would be, it'd be amazing. Y'all want to give me a gift before I turn 50? Let's do that. Let's have everybody in church one Sunday. I'd just be so happy. Amen. So uh, <laughs> it's only a few months away, by the way. Anyways, before I turn 50. Mom, your, your youngest is going to be 50. Can you believe that? Unbelievable. I'm going to be 50. And I'm your youngest child. You are a hot Oma, let me tell you. You look good. Yes, I'm happy about it. I'm happy that those genes are in my body. I'm just saying. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> hey, props to my mom. Uh, anyways, last week, I don't know if you remember, but um, at the end of worship, I uh, prophesied that we were at the end of a chapter. And I really believe that God was putting a period on, you know, regardless of how you've lived the last 10 years of your life, whether they were good or bad, probably a bunch of stuff in between, that there was a period coming to the end of that and that we were actually turning the page and that there was a new story that was beginning. And um, I, you know, last week I was just so, like, my heart was just so overwhelmed with, um, it was just, I think I even said it, we were pregnant. Like, you could just feel the, the promises of God in this building. Um, and I was like really excited about the matter of fact, when I, when I got that quick little word, I was, something really hit my heart and I just started to think about some things and started to make some plans in my own brain about how I was going to cross over. I don't know about you, but whenever God says anything to me, I immediately begin to think, how am I going to access God's presence in my life for that thing that he's saying? And so one thing I began to think about was that, you know, when you've been in a story for how many of you, like, have ever, like, most of y'all probably are not book readers, unfortunately. In my day, we had to read books. But anyways, we would read trilogies and different things. And whenever the series would come to an end, I'd be sad because I just began to know the characters, and I was all into the story. And, you know, and even now, if you, you, know, you have Netflix series and different things that you watch, and, and you get so involved in the series that when it's over, you feel like there's a death in the family. You know what I mean? It's like... Or, you know, we watch series and the, the season comes to an end and you're like, I can't wait for another, I can't wait for next season. Oh, my God. We, we feel this mourning of this loss. And as that word came about, I thought, you know, what am I going to, what, if, what am I holding on to that I, that I don't feel like I'm ready to let go of that God wants me to let go of? You know what I mean? Because I want to enjoy him turning the page and writing some new things into my life, but I had to be willing to let go of the old chapters. Even though there may have been good things in those chapters, because some of the things in my life, They've sucked, and I don't want to bring them on. Amen? Like, let's just be real. But there are some things that I love and I cherish, and I don't want to leave them behind. But there's some things that are even good that have to be left behind so that we can enter into what God has for us in the new, in the new season. There's always this give and take. But, well, actually, God gives more than he that We have to take away things from our lives so that we can get more of him. Um, but he always asks us to consecrate ourselves and to... Uh, be willing to let go of anything. And what's harder is the seemingly good things in our life, the things that aren't harmful for us that he even says, let's let go of that too. And you're like, but I like that. And it's not a sin. And he's like, yeah, I know. But if you want to be strengthened and be able to receive the things I want to put on you, you have to get rid of excess weight. Amen? And so sometimes we have to let down the things that we don't really want to let down, but that's not even my message. That's just a nice bunny trail for all of you who needed it. Um, but after uh, I had said that, the next day, an email came across um, from uh, Lana Wassner, and she gave a prophecy, And but this was a subject line, and I immediately sent it to uh, Ren and James, because I was like, what? 
But this was a subject line. It said, the Lord showed me large books called the Book of Beginnings. And I was like, rut row. You know, all of a sudden my signal, ding, 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 ding. There's a confirmation coming. There's a confirmation coming. And so I read it. And I just want to show you this, share with you this one little bitty thing that she said. First of all, she talked about the, she defined the word beginnings. And it means the point in time or space at which something begins, duh. But it's uh, synonymous with dawn. We talked about dawn yesterday, last week too. Dawn, birth, inception, conception, origination, genesis, emergence, the rise, the start, the starting, the starting point. The launch, the onset, the outset, the unfolding, the development, the developing, the debut, the kickoff, or the commencement opening. That's what beginning means. Remember, we're turning the page. There's a new beginning that's happening. Amen? She says, the Lord spoke to me that in 2020 there are going to be multiple beginnings and birthings. We have entered into a new era, a new beginning, and in 2020 there's going to be a dawning, a rising, a launching, an unfolding, and an opening that's going to take place like never before. There's going to be clarity and development of vision like never before. There's going to be manifestation of things that God has said in the dark come into the light in their manifestation. There'll be significant birthing of promises in 2020 and mo monumental upgrades. And there will also be conception of new vision from the Lord, new assignments, and new commissions. Woo. Amen. I don't know about you, but I received that. But whenever there's a prophetic promise, of course, there's going to be a spiritual battle along with it. Amen. Spiritual will be the key word there. Now, those spiritual battles manifest in this realm. So even though you may be dealing with a bank account that's low, or you may be fired from your job, or you may get sick, all of those things are natural consequences of a spiritual battle. Don't lose focus on the natural and realize it all has a spiritual root. And those things come at us because there are promises and blessings and benefits and, most important, presents that God wants to give us. And we have to understand that when we say yes to the promise, we are saying yes to everything that God has to put pressure on in our lives to make us ready for what God wants to give to us. It's just like if you are a woman and you're pregnant. Your body goes through so many changes. I was, when my, my, my first well, my first pregnancy after I was saved, I remember studying, and I, w I was shocked at the, um, the, it's called relaxin that gets releases into a, a woman's body. And that is so that her joint, everything, her joints, her hips, everything can begin to move and make way for the baby, to carry the baby. This is just one little hormone that women carry that all of a sudden, you don't even know you have it in your body until you become pregnant. And it makes you able to hold a baby. And what's crazy is that's why you swell, your joints feel all funky, because it doesn't just go to your pelvis, it goes to your entire body. So your body physically has to make itself ready to carry a promise. So the same thing happens to us as spirit beings. Our spirit receives the seed of the promise, and it's growing. And then God has to do certain things in our lives so that he can stretch us and cause us to be able to carry not just carry, but more importantly, how to birth the very thing he's trying to get to us. Because here's the thing. No matter what the promise of God is for your life or that what you're believing for, it's not going to fall out of the sky and hit you on the head. It's going to come through you. Amen. I remember years and years and years ago, I was believing God for a car. Me and my husband wanted a car. We wanted a new car. I was driving that old Pontiac Grand Am. He had that old Corsica. It was all rusted on top. Anyway, we were living large. And I, w I wanted a new car, and so did he. And so I started thinking, i got to plant seed, you know what I mean, so I'm, all this stuff. And then Ricky and I don't see things the same way. That's why he's an apostle and I'm a prophet. So I'm thinking, I plant a seed, and God's going to bring it. I'm gonna, so I started, I planted seed, and I went to the car lot and started looking around for a car. And my husband's like, what are you doing? We can't afford it. I said, I'm planting seed for a car, and a car is not going to fall out of the sky and hit my driveway. I'm going to have to go where cars are. That was my thought process. I mean, I was newly saved. I was, this is what I thought. So he's like, there's no way we can afford that. But God made a way. And I went. I picked out what I wanted. I said, that's what I want. And I believe for it. And he, he was like, I'm like, I kept going outside. And I'm like, it's not coming. It's not falling down from the sky. Yes, we got to go do something. You know what I mean? So anyways, I got the car. Anyways, long story short. <laughs> but that's like, 
you know, I'm believing for certain financial things in 2020, and so I'm constantly asking, how do I have to, what seed do I have to plant? I started asking yesterday especially, and I'm waiting by the end of service a day when God tells me what I'm supposed to plant to hurl me in to my next decade because I believe you only can reap if you sow. And you sow, I sow money, I sow time, I sow kindness, I, co- I, I sow everything. Everything, we all sow everything. But for me personally, if I, I don't plant corn and get peach trees. If you plant corn, you get corn. So if I need financial breakthrough in my life, then I want, I know I have to plant finan- finances. Amen. Yeah. That's a word, I don't know, some of y'all are like, ooh, she's one of them prosperity preachers. I believe in prosperity, absolutely. The, pros- the prosperous, uh, Jesus is prosperous in every single way. It's not all about money. However, if you think that you can go to wherever it is you want to go and give them a smile, they're going to give you what you want for free. It ain't going to happen. Amen? Money makes our world go around. And none of us make our own money. God gives us a job. God's the source. I know. Some of y'all are so upset right now. I can, I can feel it. Oh, I can feel it. I don't care. I'll bless you with that truth. You keep planting a smile and you ain't planting a dollar, you're going to get a whole bunch of smiles and not any dollars. Amen. You don't got to plant a lot, but you got to plant something. If all you got is 10 cents, you plant 10 cents. Believe me, in the beginning, my tithe was $10. And I planted $10 faithfully. And every single year, I'm going to say it because I can feel it in the air. Every single year since I've been saved, I ask God, what am I supposed to give over my tithe? Your tithe is your tithe. That's not your offering. And I increase my tithe every single year. I give more in my tithe than I make. I tithe a lot more than I make. And every year I ask God, because why? Because I, I want to grow every year. Amen. I'm going to have a beach house in Florida. That's right, one of these days. Amen. Y'all get mad with that too. Okay, so anyways. I just figured I'd go all in. I'm there. So when I was little... Uh, we, the big treat in my house was we would go to hotels and there'd be a swimming pool. You remember that? Oh, remember that when you was little? Your mom, you'd, you'd, go, you'd go to a Holiday Inn. You'd be like, I am living large right now. And then, like, so and I grew up in Germany, so we didn't have a lot of pools. Well, we had, we had a pool. But anyways, I would never, like, walk in. I always jumped and dove. Like, I didn't, I didn't care how deep it was. I would just run and jump. Because I didn't feel like I should get cold on my feet and then, like, get cold on my ankles and then get used to it to my knees. And then I'm like, this is stupid. Just jump in. Just get cold all over, and then you'll be acclimated. Why make it slow? It's like, why tear the band off a little at a time? Just rip the whole thing off. I'm the same way in spiritual things. And that's why I dove all the way into a beach house. Amen. So, okay. I love you. Let's get back on track. So, spiritual battles. Amen. We just went through one. Okay, so. Okay, we all have crazy obstacles, right? We all go through them. So, if I kept thinking of how if we don't often see the fulfillment of a promise as the beginning, we see it as the end. And this is error. It's like when you, I remember when I, uh, I'll just, it'll be walk down memory lane today with Annette. When I was, some of you may or may not know, when I was younger, I had four abortions. So by the time I got born again and realized, made some mistakes, um, my body had turned on itself and I was no longer able to become pregnant. Um, my, my pituitary gland shut down. I wasn't, I, uh, wasn't menstruating anymore. I, I wasn't able to have a baby. And so I started to go through fertility treatments. And I was believing God for, um, to have a baby because I, I finally felt, you know, I was loved and I was in a, a beautiful covenant relationship. And, you know, I, I wanted to... Um, give my husband uh, a child. Uh, so I had gone through fertility treatments, and they just weren't working, and it was overwhelming, and it's a lot of money. And um, one Wednesday night, I had gone, one Wednesday afternoon, I had gone to the hospital, and uh, they told me I wasn't pregnant. I had a blood test, told me I wasn't pregnant, and I was just ticked off. I was really mad. So I was going to church that night, because uh, it was Wednesday night, and I just told God, I am done. I'm not doing this ever again. This is stupid. I don't want children. I'm done trying. So we go to church, and I start to walk in the door, and Pastor Tracy says, hey, kid, we got a guest speaker here today. You know, it's this guy from Arizona. Well, I walk into the church, and there's a quadriplegic in a a wheelchair. He can only move his thumb and his mouth. 
and I'm thinking, what is going on with this? You know what I mean? And so his name was Howard Bell. He's, he's with, uh, he's actually touring around with Eddie James right now, uh, preaching at some of his stuff. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. He's still alive. He's supposed to have been dead like 20 years ago. Um, but uh, he's, uh, I walked in. Well, he prophesied to me. Let me tell you, he prophesied. That man was scared. He's, you know when God prophesies and you're like, the fear of God like grips you and you're like, I, I repent, I repent, I repent. That's how that was. So anyways, he began to prophesy to me and he knew that I was unable to ha- have children. And he prophesied to me and literally like 28 days later, I had a cycle. And a couple months later, I was pregnant. And so when I found out I was pregnant, I was like, yes, God answered prayer. The end. So wrong. You know what it was? The beginning. <laughs> because now not only, I was just thinking about I got to get pregnant. Because once I get pregnant, then it's done. But that's not it. I wasn't done. Now I was entering into a whole new world of raising a child. And then, rut row, I'm pregnant again. I didn't want to back to back. You know, it's funny is later on as I was thinking about it, I remember when I was little, I would, I would say, I'm never having children after I am 30 years old. Never, never, never. And I had Brendan in November of 1999. I was 29 years old, and I never had a child after that. I was like, so when I was little saying stuff like that, God held strong to it. But anyways, I thought being pregnant was the end. But it was just the very beginning of what God was doing in my life. And I still think even now we don't do it on purpose, but we think once I get what God has told me I can have, it's over, and I got to start something new. And I want you to change your mindset today. Because whatever it is that God is bringing to us, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It's a whole new journey. It's a whole new uh, adventure with him that we get to experience on this new life that he's bringing to us. So I, I know that I know it's so easy to long for something so much. And we get sometimes, if we're really earnest and disciplined, we pray faithfully. And we're always speaking the word of God over our lives, over certain areas. And and we're, we're always speaking things of faith over us. And we're diligent. And we do the right things. And that's all the right stuff to do. But once we get it, we're like, oh, I can quit fighting now. But when we do that, we don't enjoy what he's given us. And that's error. We have to learn to not just endure to receive it, but then to receive it, to enjoy it. It's the gift that he's given to us. And he doesn't want us to be like, oh, it's over. What can we do to even enhance it more, what he's given to us? And so I kind of want to change that mindset. um, And hopefully we'll do that this morning. And then we're going to have communion together. How about that? You all excited about that? I knew, so, I knew last week after the church was over that the, we were supposed to take communion together today, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Because in order for us, to, we, I want us to take our next steps into, into this new decade with intimate hearts, consecrated in covenant with God, and ready and prepared to receive what he has for us. Jesus is all about new beginnings. He loves to bring us his promises. He loves to bring us his blessings. He likes to refresh our lives. And I want to look at a couple of things. Literally, every hour, God woke me up, and he would, he'd say, obstacle one, and he'd say something, and I would see, I would hear a word, and I'm just giving you exactly what he gave to me, okay? So obstacle, I'm going to look at four things that happen that we need to conquer inside of ourselves. First, the first thing I want to look at is when you're the only one, have, have you ever been in your family where you're the only believer? Or you're in your workplace and you are the only believer? It can feel so overwhelming when you're the only one believing God. And you're like, why? <laughs> People think you are insane. They don't understand you. They don't know why you can't just be like everybody else. And it is very difficult. And we get into a serious battle. And we can, we can actually trip over things in our own lives if, when we are the only person in a situation who's believing. I, look, I have been in hospital rooms where every single person in the hospital room was all like, let's just get ready to die. It's all death, all death. And I'm there thinking, no, life is coming. Life is coming. And when you don't agree with them in prayer for death, they're like, who are you? And you need to shut up because that's not what we're, we're, we're actually believing for death. That would be the easier thing. I'm like, no, but life is the better thing. It's awkward, <laughs> to say the least. So in Genesis chapter 7, 8, I'm not reading it. Amen. Hallelujah. Noah was literally the only man on the earth 
who was listening to God. God came to him in the midst of nothing but evil, and he was like, okay, I found you to be righteous, and you have integrity, and I'm going to use you and your family, and I'm going to continue on this lineage of mankind on the earth through you. He was the only person on the earth that had a heart towards God, which is crazy. It, literally, he's the only one. And so when you read Genesis 7 and 8, God comes to him. Um, he commissions him to build the ark. Uh, and then, like, literally for 100 years, he's mocked. Look, some of y'all are so sensitive, you can't handle one thing on social media coming at you. You get, you get your panties all up your, you know, because you're like, you're offended. Get over it, for one. For two, you need to get some resilience in your life. And if social media is a problem, get off social media. Amen. But I can look at you sideways and you get mad at me. You know what I mean? Like, why are we all so sensitive? Poor Noah, he's out there building an ark, and ain't nobody's seen it drop from the sky ever. And they're like, you are a madman. Where's the straight jacket for old Noah? Noah needs some Prozac or something. Noah's losing his mind. You know what I mean? And everybody's mocking him and making fun of him. And he's like, I'm the only one here who's hearing God. Okay, let's just put this in perspective. You're the only one hearing God. Do you think everyone around you thinks you're actually hearing God? No. <laughs> and when you're at work and someone's sick and you're like, I'm going to believe for your healing, they're like, whatever. Look, I was in the workplace. I was one of you. Mocking. <laughs> I'd be like, Jesus, Jesus, whatever, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. I need to go charge. Yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut up. Drove me insane. But thank God for that one woman at work. And then I became the other crazy woman at work. So there were two of us now at work who were crazy. I mean, like, literally crazy. But you've got to be kind of out there. If you're going to hear God and you're going to build a boat, if you're going to go out there and you're going to hear God and you're going to claim healing for somebody, you've got to be ready. You have to be ready to be mocked. You have to be ready to be the only one on your side. Amen. You ever get invited to dinner and you're fasting? You're like, oh, I'd really like to go, but I'm fasting. They're like, you're what? You're having a colonoscopy? Nope, just fasting because I love Jesus. They're like, whatever. You go on a date, you meet somebody, you're like, well, I'm not having sex till I'm married. They're like, whatever. You're a freak. Amen. <laughs> Imagine enduring 100 years of that. Oh, Lord have mercy. People look at you cross-eyed. <laughs> I remember not doing Santa Claus. What? We're not hunting Easter eggs. What? People thought we were insane. When I first got saved, my mom thought I was in a cult. She sent my friend to spy on the church to make sure we weren't sacrificing no animals up there on the altar. But I was crazy. I was in love with Jesus. And I was willing to endure whatever I had to endure to get more of him. You know, but one day God said, Noah, get in. And Noah got in. And God shut the door. Now, here's the thing. He had been building that ark for 100 years. Do you think that when the flood started and he got into the ark that that was the end of the promise? That was the total beginning of everything. When he finally got to get in, he's like, woo, finally. Everybody knows I'm not crazy. And he's laughing, ha, 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 you're all dead. <laughs> I'm alive. I know that y'all don't think Noah did that, but I would have done that if I was Noah. I'd be like, who's talking now? Who's mocking me now? I'd be all up in that. Because <laughs> you don't see Noah going, Lord, if you would just spare one of them. They know that pray. Abraham did that, but Noah didn't do that. Noah's like, peace out, I'm out. <laughs> Sorry. Now you know how I read the Bible. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so think about it. The door shuts. There's no more voices. There's no more people hurling insults at him. Nobody else is mocking him, making fun of him. He feels like the champion. I saved my entire family. I heard God. I was the only one, and I did what he told me to do. Now, Month number two, month number three on that boat, I'd be like, God, hello, what's going on? 
He was on that boat for one year and 17 days, 17 weeks. <sighs> I was on a carnival cruise for two weeks and thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. Don't send me on a cruise again. I love you. That was pastor appreciation one year. I love you. Don't want to go again. Put me on a plane. Fly me to Turks and Caicos. I, I, I don't want to go on a boat. Because when I'm on a boat and I can't get off a boat, I'm a very violent woman. I couldn't get off the boat, and there was no Dr. Pepper. So y'all know what my life was with this man. They, the first thing he said, he goes, they ain't got no Dr. Pepper on this boat. I was like, uh-oh, we are in so much trouble. Y'all don't even know. Oh, you know. You bought him a shirt. You know. It's bad. So I, boats and me don't get along. So I don't want to be on the boat. So poor Noah. I'm thinking a year on that boat, okay? He's floating. He's like, what, did I, like, build this ark for 100 years so I can sit in this boat for another 100? What is going on? And then all of a sudden, the boat stops. Now, praise God, the boat stopped, but you can't get out. There's still, it's resting on Mount Ararat, but he can't get out of it. There's still water everywhere. Oh, my God. Now it's even worse. We've stopped floating, but now I really can't get off. That was me at customs. We pulled into port. I'm ready to get off the boat. I can't get off the boat. i got to wait for everybody else to get off the boat so I can get in line so that I can get off the boat. When me being in Texas and not being able to get off that boat, I thought I was going to have a panic attack. It was so bad. It was so bad. <laughs> I'm telling you, me and Noah, I feel his pain, man. I feel it. So I'm like, okay, he's on, you know, he has to wait now another few weeks before he can even get off the boat because the water has to begin to subside, and he can't get out. Can you imagine being on the boat not being able to get out? All the people, your family. I love my family, but if I'm stuck in a boat with you for over a year, forget about it. <laughs> forget about it. And then you add animals and stinkies. Oh, forget about it. Forget about it. I would be like, me and Ricky be strong. Can you imagine me and him? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Jesus, I love my husband. We are very volatile with each other in those kind of situations. But we work. Amen. But he finally gets to get off the boat. And then I'm thinking, it's over. Finally, now the promise is fulfilled. But it was really just the beginning. All over again. Look at this in Genesis chapter 8, verse 13 through 22. I just want to say, first of all, that I am so glad we don't live five, six, seven hundred years anymore. I just want to bless God for a life of just a hundred. That, that's good. I couldn't imagine being 500 years old. <laughs> oh, no. Amen. It was like that, that, that couple that married. How long were they married? 80, 80 years. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to get a Pentecostal jerk with that. Okay. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 13, it says, In the year 601 of Noah's life, on the first day of the month, the waters were drying up from the land, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was drying. And on the 27th day of the second month, the land was finally dry. And, Noah, and God spoke to Noah, saying, Go forth from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your, uh, their wives with you. Bring forth every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the ground, that they may breed abundantly on the land and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his wife and his sons and their wives with him, after being in the ark for one year and ten days, every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, whatever moves on the land went forth by families out of the ark. And Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean four-footed animal and of every clean fowl or bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. When the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the imagination of man's heart is evil and wicked from his youth. Neither will I ever again smite and destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. That was not an end. It was a beginning. He put an altar there for the Lord. The Lord smelt the fragrance of that beautiful offering. And then he reestablished the very thing he established in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. I want you to go forth. I want you to multiply. I want you to be fruitful. And Noah's life started really, in a whole new way. He had a whole new, can you imagine the confidence of that man getting off that boat? After knowing he heard God and nobody else did? That sets a whole new journey with him in his life on how he's going to listen and hear and obey. Now, the second thing, so the first thing's ourselves when we're the only one. 
And the second thing is our mistakes. Mistakes, mistakes, mistakes. And how many of you think that if you make a mistake, you are forfeiting yourself from the promise of God? I know you may say, no, and that I know that I don't. But you know what? I see you when you're down and you're, re- and you're feeling rejected and you feel like, I know I messed up and God can't give me what it is that I know he's supposed to because you made a mistake. Well, let's go there. Genesis chapter 12, God talks to a man named Abram and he tells him, I want you to get up. I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your family behind. I don't know how the encounter happened. I don't know if he came in a cloud. I don't know if he, what form he went in, but Abram heard it and he did exactly what God told him to do. He picked up, he left Ur, and he went to a land that he did not know where he was going. Now, for time's sake, if you don't know Abram's journey, you should read it. But just to, just to paraphrase, Abram had made one mistake after another. He was continually in a place where he had to lie about who his wife was. I mean, it was, it was famine. He wasn't supposed to leave, and he left. I mean, just one stupid thing after another. Um, his mistakes were like kind of never ending. And, and then you get to Genesis chapter 16, and he's like, look, I don't have any kids. Sarah, my, my wife Sarah, she doesn't have any kids. And so they come up with a brilliant plan. Give him Hagar, my handmaiden. You can have sex with her. She can have a son. And boom, now you have something to live to build your life on. And this seemed like a good idea at the time. I don't even understand that. Nothing in my makeup says that's a good idea. And it went poorly from that moment on. But you know what's funny is, this is in Genesis chapter 16. Abram's still called Abram. God, he knows God wants to bless him, but he still doesn't have a kid. And do you know that you, you turn the page, and guess what happens? God comes to him, and he says, I am going to make you the father of many nations, and I'm changing your name. Now your name is going to be Abraham. He was like, okay, there's a problem. Because first of all, my wife is impotent, I'm impotent, and guess what? Now I have a son. His name is Ishmael but he's not the the promised seed. Can you imagine going around saying that you're the father of many nations when you don't have any children? (laughs) I mean, it's hard enough to to say that, you know, I'm a believer and God bless and he loves me, and then you know that you're making one mistake after the other. But when you're walking around saying, I literally am going to be the father of many nations, I'm going to, my seed's going to be so much, it's going to cover the earth, it's going to be the stars in the sky, and people are like, yeah, whatever, and they look at Ishmael, and they're like, yeah, sure, sure, you're going to be the father of many nations. But he was. And before you know it, guess what happens? Sarah gets pregnant. She didn't get pregnant until after Abraham's name was changed. So if you look at Abraham's life, it was 25 years that he went from the time he left his home to the time he had Isaac. For 12 years and then another, it was, he, was, it was, he was 13 years, it was 13 years in when he had Ishmael. So for that entire 13 years, those 25, his name was Abram. From year 13 until he had Isaac, he changed his name. And so every time he went somewhere, he introduced himself as Abraham. I'm the father of many nations. I'm the father of many nations. I'm the father of many nations. That many years, he was confessing that over himself, but he was still making mistakes the entire time. What was more powerful, his confession and agreement with God that his name was the father of many nations or his mistakes? His confession about who he was in Christ was far more powerful than any mistakes that he made along the way. They were so powerful. In fact, when you read the book of Romans, God never mentions one time the mistakes of Abraham. He says Abraham lived faithfully and he lived with hope and he never faltered in his faith. And that's a lie according to the word of God. But it's the truth according to the Father's heart. Because it doesn't matter how many mistakes you made. Every single time Abraham got off course, you know what he did? Go read your Bible. He stopped He made an altar to the Lord. He made a sacrifice, and he got right. Over and over and over again, every lie he told, every direction that he took that we wasn't supposed to go, every single time he made any mistake, we see the Bible come back around to the place where he said he made an altar, he offered a sacrifice to God, and he got up and he started again. And that's how we take care of our mistakes, because no matter what, you're going to fail. You and I are always going to fail. We're going to believe God for things, and along the way, in the next 10 years, we're going to trip up. It doesn't matter. Who you say you are is more powerful than your mistakes. And if you say, I am a child of God, 
I know that I'm a son of God. I've been adopted. And if, I'm, if, I, if I am little Christ, and Christ is in me, and I'm seated in heavenly places, what mistake can I make that will cancel out what God wants to do for me? There's not one you can make. The only mistake you can make is not making an altar. The only mistake that you and I can make is to not get on our face before God again and say, I screwed that one up, sorry. Get me back on track. And do you know what he does? He immediately scoops us, us. he hugs us, he loves us, he kisses us, and he says, go. Those lessons and those mistakes are necessary for our development. Look, we've all made plenty of mistakes, plenty. As a leader, I've made plenty of mistakes. And I've never promised this family that we wouldn't make mistakes. But I've always admitted them, and I've always been honest and got back on my face and said, screwed that up, let's try this one again. You know what I mean? Because that's all that you and I can do. Because we are, we, are, we are human beings trying to live this life for Jesus. And he's not looking for perfection. He's just looking for honesty. He's looking for humility and meekness. So don't let your mistakes bother you. Don't give up. Don't stop just because you trip. Look, tripping because you make a mistake is one thing. Tripping because you swept it under the carpet is another because whatever you sweep under, you will eventually trip over. Yes. Tripping is going to happen either way. Either you trip with humility or you trip with pride. There's two different kinds of brokenness in the word of God. Amen? When Isaac was born, it was the beginning. Matter of fact, he, ne- he didn't only change Abraham's name. In that moment, God said, okay, you've shown yourself faithful to me by continually to come to me. And so now... I want you to circumcise yourself and your family. And when Abraham did that, he had that cutting away of his flesh. There was a a new covenant that came into being. Thank God for the new covenant of God. And Abraham didn't only change his name, but he changed his heart. And when we do that, let me tell you what, God will always find a way to overtake us with his promises. Every single time. Just realign yourself. Amen? Okay, so the first thing, it's only you. I know it's a battle. The second thing is mistakes, mistakes, mistakes. And the third thing is, it's just freaking unfair. (laughs) I don't, okay, don't even be honest, but you should be honest. How many of you have gone through some things, even of late, and said this is just not even fair? I am serving you. I am waiting. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. And it would, oh, when other people get blessed, it's very hard to be joyous when you are in in a season of yearning. And other people are getting their desires filled. And you're like, hello, hello, hello. What about me, 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 me? I've been out here on this limb waiting for 20 years. Hello, hello, hello. They walk into covenant with you and you're like, oh, I love them, I love them. Like, hello, it's unfair. It feels unfair. Here's a revelation for you. Life is not fair. Amen. (laughs) But God is faithful. Genesis 37 through chapter 40, chapter 37 through chapter 46, you can read that all for yourself. It all started with a dream. Poor little old Joseph didn't conjure up the dream himself. He just had a dream. And his naivete, he was like, guess what? I had a dream. All y'all were bound down to me. I mean, like, he didn't make himself dream the dream. How are you going to be mad at your brother for dreaming a dream? But they were incensed. They were like, oh, we will never bow. Well, actually, you will, but that's not... <laughs> That's in a few chapters. But all he did was dream a dream. And he tells them the dream, and all of a sudden, they hate him. They cannot stand him. He has a special coat. And now he's thinking everybody's going to listen to him one of these days. And they're like, oh, no, you're not. And so what they do, they throw him in a, in, a, in a pit. They throw him in a well. Like, if that's not bad enough, like, if you were to throw your brother in a well and walk away, leave him in there for an hour, that's pretty bad. I mean, like, they were gone. And then they were like, oh. so then they decide to, you know, hey, let's just slave, sell them into slavery. Oh, like that's any better. Like that should ease your conscience a little bit. You know, not bad enough we kicked him in the well and now we're going to sell him off. So they sell him into slavery. They do this whole lie to their father. It's just crazy. The story is crazy. I'm telling you what, the endurance and patience and, and just character of Joseph is a, is a lifelong study. But then he gets sold into slavery and then he gets falsely accused of rape. 
And then he goes to prison for not even doing it. I mean, you talk about unfair. I don't care how bad you and I have had some things happen in our life. It has not been that bad. Nobody in here has been sold into slavery, thrown in a pit, or gone to jail because of something you didn't do. Amen. Now, you think, because we read that, we're like, oh, Joseph got to his place with, uh, you know, he was second command of Egypt. God came through. Yeah. Here's the difference between you and me and Joseph. The moment that the brothers return. This is now the moment. See, God's promise to Joseph was, I'm going to, he's, that there was going to be this, he was going to be in a place of leadership, and that his, he was going to actually care for his family. I know it says to bow down, but there was, there was a reason God gave him the dream the way that he did. I can't even imagine how Joseph felt after every single experience he went through, knowing he didn't do anything wrong. And let me tell you, one of the hardest things that we'll go through as believers is the fires and the trials that we endure when we didn't do anything but stay faithful to God. I, personally, I could tell you some stories, but it, when, when, when I am assailed and crucified for something I didn't do, and everybody turns and hates me, I've, I've walked through that flame. It, it's, not, it's not pleasant at all. And all you want to do is justify yourself and defend yourself, and God tells you no. You are not allowed to say a word. Oh, that's, that's the most difficult thing I've ever, I was worse than the, worse than the death of my daughter. It was, it was horrible because I wanted to defend myself. It's not fair. What you're saying about me is not true, and what you say I did is not right. I mean, all those, but you know what? I wasn't allowed to defend myself, and Joseph wasn't either. He had to go through, and he had to stay integrous between him and God, and his character and his heart had to be right before God, and he, he even writes at one point he wanted to become one with the iron bars that held him in. He was so depressed. He was so overcome. He's like, if I could just become one with the bar, I'd be happier than I am right now. It's hard when you are assailed and you've done nothing wrong. It's simple things. It's simple things. Things you didn't ever intended for anybody to get mad at. Maybe you were having a bad day. You didn't say hello right. And now all of a sudden, someone that you thought loved you hates you. Why? That's not right. Don't you have more grace for me than that? Does it matter? You don't get to defend yourself. You just got to be integrous. You just got to stay there and do what God told you to do and be right with him. It's hard. And so I can't imagine at what point he probably thought this was never going to come to pass, that, you know, but now he's even in command. He's in command for seven years, and he doesn't hear nothing from anybody. And then all of a sudden, there's a famine in the land, and all of a sudden, all of his brothers start coming out. And this is the moment that he's really tested. I know it's crazy. I'm thinking he's got to be tested in the pit. He's got to be tested when he's, you know, serving in Potiphar's house. He's got to be tested in the prison. Nope, the real test came when his brothers showed up. What was he going to do? When I read Joseph's story, I weep because I don't have that heart. I really don't. I want to have that heart with all it's inside of me. And I've got some things in my own personal life with some with relatives. And I read that story and my heart just absolutely, I'm crushed because I want to have the same kind of love that Joseph had. Let's look at Genesis chapter 45. This is after Joseph has been with his brothers and they don't know who he is. Joseph said, he says, Joseph could not restrain himself any longer. Before all those who stood by him, and he, uh, he called out, cause every man to go out from me. So no one stood there with Joseph while he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept and sobbed aloud. And the Egyptians who had just left him heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers could not reply, for they were distressingly disturbed and dismayed at the startling re- realization that they were in, in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, I pray you. And they did so. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not be distressed and disheartened or vexed or, and angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For those two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five more years to, in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a posterity, 
and to continue a remnant on the earth to save your lives by a great escape and save you for, uh, for many survivors. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he made him, oh, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler of all of the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up, my father, and tell him, your son will live in the, uh, uh, Joseph says to you, God has put me, oh, I'm sorry, my eyes just got blurry. Verse 10, you will live in the land of Goshen, you will be close to me, you and your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. And there I will sustain and provide for you so that you and your household and all that is yours may not come to poverty and want, for there are yet five more years of scarcity and famine. Now notice, your own eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin can see that I am talking to you personally in your language and not through an interpreter. And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen. And you shall hurry and bring my father down here. The moment that those men came close to him, and he revealed who he was, was the beginning of that dream coming to pass. It was not the end. It was not the fulfillment. It was the beginning. God sent the, the man in all humility. Joseph says, you didn't do this to me. God sent me here. And I want you and I to remember that when we feel like things are unfair when we're waiting for things to come to pass and there's things coming at us that we didn't do and we feel like we shouldn't be in the situation that we're in, we need to remember Joseph and we need to understand that no matter what battle we're in or what location that we're in in the process, that God is the author of every step that we take. He is the person who puts us in those situations. When you know you've done nothing wrong, and you need to rest in the knowledge that God is with you, he's with me, and he's going to see us through to the end. And it doesn't matter how, look, when it comes from the family, when the wound is in, is in the, the inner circle of your life, it's extremely difficult. And as a church family, those of you who are covenanted together with us here, you know if you're family, you know it. And you know how bad it hurts when someone in your inner family strikes you. We have mourned loss in this house for a long time. And no matter how much it hurt, God was in the midst of it, and God put us there. So no matter how much you think it's not worth it, don't you dare give up. Life is unfair, and people are fickle. <laughs> and people are jealous. Jealousy is a horrible spirit. It filled Joseph's brothers, and it filled the men that crucified Jesus. But God is always faithful. He will always come through no matter what. So don't let somebody else's pettiness don't let somebody else's foolishness stop you from living in integrity and not stopping because it's not fair. It's not fair. So what? God is faithful. It's not fair. God is faithful. It's not fair. God is faithful. The last one, number four, is denial. No matter how bad the enemy around us is, the enemy inside of us is a whole lot worse. And if God does not put pressure on it, you won't even know it's in there. Jesus posed a question to his disciples, and he, says, who, he said, who do you say that I am? And they're like, some say that you are, you know, Elijah. He said, no, who do you say that I am? He looks at Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, and he was like, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Actually, at that moment, he was still Simon. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And now your name is going to be Peter. And I'm going to build my rock. I'm going to build my church on this rock. Peter is Petros, rock. But in this moment... Peter has the revelation that this is the Christ. This is the, the long-for-awaited Messiah. And he gets this 
not from anybody else. And Jesus knows that the Father has given Peter this revelation. He knows this has come from heaven. And he tells him, that revelation is what I'm going to build. All that is coming on the revelation that I, is, that I am the Messiah. Now, let me be clear, though. It is on the rock of the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, but Jesus was also simultaneously talking to Peter. As an apostle, he was talking to Peter, and he, because Jesus knew what Peter was going to be doing, and he knew what he was going to use Peter to do in building the church the way you and I know it today, and even more so that we don't fully understand. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm sure Peter was pretty happy that he got that revelation. But I love the Word of God. I love it when the Holy Spirit reveals something to me that I've never seen before. There is no, there's nothing as exciting as that. I mean, I have I did a lot of drugs. I've been I did lots of stuff in my life. But me sitting down alone with my Bible and God taking the words of that page and making them come alive to me, there is no better high in the world to me than Revelation. I love Revelation. So I just got this feeling that Peter was like, ooh, I got that right. You know what I mean? Like, ooh, I found <laughs> There is a God used me. I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. It feels good to be used by God. And there's, we have to navigate the, the, the you know, the, you can't be prideful, but you got to be, you have to enjoy that God uses you. There's a really, there's a hard journey in walking through that, and we all have to do that, and it's, it's a good thing to go through. But, you know, Peter was like, yeah, I got this, man. You know, and then you fast forward. And Peter, like, like Peter has come to know Jesus very intimately. So he's like, he's like in the inner circle. So he, he really sees everything. And Peter can't even begin to understand what Jesus is talking about, betrayal and going away. And they're just like, what are you talking about? This is stupid. And then, of course, all of a sudden, uh, Jesus begins to reveal to Peter some things. And the whole thing is Peter, Peter didn't know what was in Peter. And this is something I feel very strongly about in the days to come. I'm trying to use that for my bookmark. Peter did not know the propensity he had within himself. And neither do you, and neither do I. And until God puts pressure on us, to, let's just think of it a gross way. Let's all imagine a big pimple, big white-filled pimple. Because you know somebody walks by with a big old pimple, you're like, pop it, pop it, pop it. You know what I mean? Like all of a sudden, you see it on your face, what are you going to do? You're going to pop it, pop it, pop it. Look, this is how we get life application. Amen, right now. Was it Austin Powers? Molly, 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 molly. Right? But you can't pop a mole, amen? But you can't a pimple. And you know that that pimple's been on your face. You just didn't realize it until what? Until it festered and it came out. Now, most normal people would do what? Put pressure on it, get it out. You're one of those freaks that likes to pop everyone's pimples, and I think that's evil. But anyways, <laughs> she'd be like, ooh, let me get that. I'm like, you better get away from me with your ooh, let me get that. No, uh I'll pop my own pimples. Thank you very much. People that, like, walk, go around and squeeze stuff, I'm like, y'all are nasty. I can't watch that Dr. Pimple Popper. That's some nasty stuff, man. But think about that pimple being on your face or whatever and you not knowing about it, and then all of a sudden there are things that go on in your life to bring it to the surface, right? And then you've got to what? You've got to get it out. So you have to put pressure on it to get it out. It's the same thing with our heart. We don't understand what's in us. And it's not even that we're ignorant. I, well, it is like we're, it's not like we're trying to hide sin, but sometimes we don't know what's in there until God begins to stir something and then he brings it to the surface. And once he brings it to the surface, we have to deal with us. Amen. This doesn't make us hopeless hypocrites and horrible sinners. This makes us people who have things in our heart that we don't know about. It's how, it's how we deal with what he reveals to us that really matters. So Peter doesn't know. He has zero clue what's inside of him. When Peter talks to Jesus and he tells him, 
I will die for you. There's no way I would not pull out my sword and let somebody kill me before I would ever let them lay a hand on you. When Peter is talking like this to Jesus, he's not being fake. He's, his authentic self is saying, I will die for you. I left everything to follow you. Peter wasn't faking it. I mean, Jesus walks by the man and he leaves everything to follow him. So when he's like, no, there's no way. There's no way someone's going to kill you. I'll, I'll stand in between. Look, I think about if someone puts a gun to my head, am I going to deny Jesus? In my imagination, I'm like, you ain't going to kill me. Jesus is Lord. I hope I'm just as strong when a gun's pointed to my head. In my, in my Annette self, I'm like, yeah, shoot me, I don't care. But in the moment, when I'm on the other end of a gun, I'm like, I hope, I, I hope I'm just as confident then as I am right now standing here. My heart is to be, but I don't know what's in me. And I may never know unless one day someone puts a gun to my head. I don't know. But my heart is to prepare my heart for such a time as that. So Peter doesn't know what's in him. So Jesus understands that the church he's going to build needs somebody who doesn't have them in them. He knows that for the church to flourish, that it cannot be governed by a man who is full of pride. It has to be governed by a man who will lay down his life in love. So as Jesus begins to confront Peter's inner pimple, he's telling him, not that he's ashamed of him, he's actually preparing him for the greatest call of his entire life. And I know by the Spirit of God, that there are some pressures that God's going to put on you and I in the days to come. And we must understand that he's not doing it because we are hopeless hypocrites and horrible sinners. He's doing it because he's preparing us for the very thing he's promised us. Luke 22, verse 31. This is at the Last Supper. He says, Peter, my dear friend, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Satan has obtained permission to come and sift you all like wheat and test your faith. But I've prayed for you, Peter, that you would stay faithful to me no matter what comes. Remember this. After you have turned back to me and have been restored, make it your life mission to strengthen the faith of your brothers. But Lord, Peter replied, I am ready to stand with you to the very end, even if it means prison or death. And Jesus looked at him and prophesied, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times that you, you will deny three times that you even know me. Mm. Peter did not hear, when you're restored, strengthen your brothers. Peter did not hear that. Jesus said it. I just read it. Y'all heard it. Peter did not hear, when I'm restored, strengthen my brothers. Peter heard, you're going to utterly deny me. And Peter's like, oh, no, not happening. I will die. I will go to prison. Oh, no, no, no. So Jesus has to say, what's happening? It's coming up. It's starting to surface. The hidden thing's starting to come up. And so Jesus then lays another one on him. He's like, yeah, you're about to deny me three times. And Peter can't even fathom what he's saying. And the prophecy and the promise of restoration and being the one who is strong enough to strengthen all of the other ones goes completely out of Peter's hearing. And I've been prophesying a lot the last two months about what God is doing in the earth. And I believe it wholeheartedly. I don't say it to get your hopes up and for God to dash them. I say them because I truly believe them. But let me tell you what. If you only hear half of what God says, you will find yourself in the same situation. Because God's going to put pressure on us. He's going to bring some things up to the surface. And you and I are going to have to fight spiritually being the only one. We're going to have to fight spiritually making one mistake after the other. We're going to have to be the only one. When it's unfair, all of these things go on. But we have to understand that we're fighting a spiritual battle. And if we will hold on, it doesn't matter. Jesus is going to restore and give to us everything that he said he was going to. But we have to be, look, we have to be fore, forewarned and forearmed. Hallelujah. 
How many times has Jesus put his finger on your heart <laughs> and point out something to you that you didn't see? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Peter would have thought Jesus was out of his mind. Let's go down to um, verse 54. I think it's funny because even in between that, Jesus, all he asked Peter to do was stay awake in the garden while he was praying. Peter could even stay awake. He wanted to stay awake, but he kept falling asleep. Now, if you do that, um, uh, let's just draw some conclusions. If you want to stay awake and you fall asleep, what makes you think that when Jesus says you're going to deny me and you're like, I ain't going to deny you? If you can't even keep your eyes open long enough, perhaps maybe he was right. Just saying. <laughs> 54. The religious, the religious leader seized Jesus and led him away, but Peter followed from a safe distance. They brought him to the home of the high priest where people were already gathered out in the courtyard. Someone had built a fire, so Peter inched closer and sat down among them to stay warm. A girl noticed Peter sitting in the firelight staring at him. She pointed him out and said, the man, this man is one of the Jesus' disciples, and Peter flatly denied it, saying, what are you talking about, girl? I don't know him. A little while later, someone else spotted Peter and said, I recognize you. You're one of his. I know it. Peter again said, I'm not one of his disciples. About an hour later, someone else identified Peter and insisted that he was a disciple of Jesus, saying, look at him. He's from Galilee, just like Jesus. I know he's one of them. And Peter was adamant. Listen, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't you understand? I don't even know him. And while the words were still in his mouth, the rooster crowed. At that moment, oh, this gets me every time. At that moment, the Lord, who was being led through the courtyard by his captors, turned around and gazed at Peter. And all at once, Peter remembered the words Jesus had prophesied over him. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times, or that you will deny three times that you even know me. Peter burst into tears, and he ran off from the crowd, and he wept bitterly. It's bad enough that you denied but in the midst of it you look up and there he is like of all the moments I don't want to make eye contact with you it's this moment and I've always said Peter did you know Peter didn't look up and see eyes of scorn he looked up and he saw eyes of love because Jesus still remembered Peter's yes he still remember when when Peter said, yes, I'll follow you. I'll leave it all to go with you. And even though Peter's feeling like a complete failure in this moment, he's done the worst thing you can do. He's denied him. It's the worst thing you could do. What other thing could you do? And he doesn't see scorn. He, he sees love. And I know, like, this compassion of Jesus, in that moment, Jesus was about Peter. His face had the countenance of all of heaven. And when Peter looked at Jesus, he saw love. And you know what hurts worse when you make a mistake? A lot of times it's love. Because you feel like such a heel, what you deserve is someone to judge you and to justify your horribleness. But Jesus doesn't do that in the midst of our mistakes. And Jesus meant what he said to Peter. He said, I'm going to build my church, and you're going to be part of it, and you're going to be the one to restore the other people around you. Because, look, Peter wasn't the only one who ran away. <laughs> Peter was stunned. He had zero clue that was in him. Zero. Have you ever been in a situation where something comes up in your heart and you're just like, that? Where did that come from? That could be good or bad. Let's go to John chapter 21.
Phil, y'all can get ready. Peter thought that this was the end of everything that he knew and loved in that moment. Think about it. It's bad enough he's feeling like a turd on the inside because he denied Jesus. At the same time, the man he loves is being crucified. The one he gave up his life for is literally dying in front of him. So his broken heart goes far beyond what you and I could probably ever comprehend in that moment because we get the we get the privilege of being on the other side of the cross. He was not. He was in the moment. So his dismay of what was inside of him was probably a hundred times worse because he did not fully understand that Jesus was going to raise himself from the grave. So he thought the last moment that he had with his, this Messiah, this God-man, was denial. That was the end of his story, period. I denied him. But three days later, oh, Jesus. Three days later, breath came back into a grave. But can you imagine what Peter walked through those days? He was so mad at himself. So much so that he was like, forget this. I'm going back to fishing. It's the only thing that I know. I gave up everything for him, and now everything is gone. I have nothing else to do. I'm just going to go back to the sea and catch some fish again because I don't know what to do now. But it wasn't the end. It was the beginning. Even denial can't stop what God wants to do in your life. That's crazy to me. You know how many times I've told God, I'm done. I quit. I'm done with this. This is stupid. I'm going to sit in the back row of some big church and not know anybody. That's where I want to hide. I don't want to go completely away from you, but I want to go find myself in some big church with thousands of people and just be a speck in a chair, pay my tithe, and go home and do whatever it is I want to do because that would be easier than this. And I feel that way when I'm denying him. And I'm doing things in my heart that I know I shouldn't be. And he's putting pressure on me and making things come up inside of me that I don't want to deal with and I don't want to face. John chapter 21, verse 15, it says, After they had breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you burn with love for me more than these? And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I have great affection for you. Then take care of my lambs, Jesus said. Jesus repeated his question a second time. Simon, son of John, do you burn with love for me? And Peter answered, yes, my Lord. You know that I have a great affection for you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. And Jesus asked him again, Peter, son of John, do you have great affection for me? And Peter was saddened by being asked the third time. And he said, my Lord, you know everything. You know that I burn with love for you. And Jesus replied, then feed my lambs. Peter denies him three times, and Jesus restores him with what? He restores him with telling Peter, yeah, that denial was in you, but guess what else is in you? Burning love and affection. And you need to hear it just as many times as you denied me. What's Peter going through? Peter's realizing that, yes, there's things inside of me that are not good, but at the same time, The part of me that loves Jesus is more powerful than any mistake or any denial that I could ever give. And Jesus is letting Peter know, you're still in this thing. You're still in this chapter of life that you're in. And guess what? Peter goes on, and what happens? He gets filled with the Holy Ghost, and 3,000 people are saved. His first message on. It was not the end. It was the beginning of this beautiful extraordinary journey that you and I are entered into today because Peter was faithful. So I don't care what it is that you and I have gone through over the last decade of our lives. You need to lay down what is not required into the new era. 
You can't, you can't carry some of those things in. I want you to lay those things down today. And if you have to literally show yourself whatever you got to do by faith, I want you to lay down those things that are hindering you so that you can go into this new season. And then I want you to embrace what it is that you know God has told you. And if you don't know what God has told you, then you know enough to say that Jesus loves me and he wants to reveal himself to me in a powerful way. That alone is one promise that's going to be for every single one of us. But it's time for us to lay down whatever needs to be laid down. And I want us to cut a covenant again this morning with God and just tell him, you know what? I'm leaving the past behind me. And I'm going to enter into a covenant and communion with you today. And thank you for your promises. And I'm going to come into a new covenant with you today. And it's going to be one of faithfulness that no matter what, no matter what I do to myself, no matter what other people do to me, no matter what things are inside of me or what mistakes I make, nothing is going to stop me from pursuing your face and your promises in my life. I don't want to enter in to 2020 with an old heart. It's time for a new one. So we're going to have communion together as a family, and then we're going to go into worship. And we're going to praise God again. And can I tell you something? How you end this decade matters. How do I say it? If you are believing God for crazy, exuberant things, I suggest you be crazy and exuberant now. We have to praise God by faith now. What our human nature does, it says, when God gives me the promise, I am going to praise him like crazy. And Jesus says, well, now faith is, so I want you to praise me like crazy now. <laughs> Some of y'all just went, mm -hmm. your whole wall went, mm -hmm. If you've got shackles on, shake them off. Lift your hands and praise to God. Give a shout unto God. Give a dance to God. Give a praise to God. You need to give him now what it is that you're waiting to give later. He says he's worthy of it now. So I want to end right, and I want to go in right. Amen? Y'all come up. So what we're going to do is we're going to have y'all come up and uh, grab the elements. Yes, bad. Y'all can come up and grab the elephants, and then we'll go back to our chairs, and then we'll take communion. Or if you want to stay at the altar and take communion, you can do that, whatever you want to do.
last week or the week before, I had somebody message me on Facebook, and they were asking about a, a situation that happened in a, a church somewhere here in Temple. That they had brought a guest and that they were doing communion, and that the, the pastor told the guests that they weren't allowed to take communion. And they were asking me how I felt about that. And we're not taking communion because you're a part of this church has nothing to do with this church at all. Communion is between you and Jesus. And you don't have to be a fiery, intimate lover of Jesus to take communion. You don't have to be committed to a local body to take communion. This is something between your heart and his. He does tell us to reflect upon the weightiness of what we're doing. It's not just simply some crackers and juice or remembering who he is and that he was the gift that was given to us from the Father. He chose to come through humanity and lay down his life for us. And he made a way for us to return back into the fullness of the Father because we had lost that way. So that's what communion is about. And so before we take it, as he plays for just a moment, I just, I just want all of us to set our hearts uh, in the right position. Just people who need a loving Savior and a good father who loves us no matter what we've done. And if we know that we have sin in our heart, we have things that we're fighting, just begin to tell him those things and tell him, look, I, I want to overcome, and I need your grace to help me. So let's just prepare our hearts for just a second, and then we'll, we'll take the bread together. Jesus was gathered with the disciples. He broke the bread and he told us that it represented the breaking of his body that was going to be bruised and broken on our behalf. And so as we take the cracker today representing the bread, 
and the word of Jesus and the body of Jesus. We do so with hearts that remember every word that he's spoken over us, every promise that he's given to us. And just every expression of his faithfulness over our lives. But I also want us to, to take eat this morning to remember the words that are coming to be fulfilled. His broken body was enough. So, Father, as we lift this bread to you right now, we thank you. We thank you for your willingness to be broken on our behalf. We're so grateful. We're so grateful, God, that you endured all that you endured so that we could enter into the truth of who you are. Father, I pray that as we take this bread today, that it would be a sign for the taste of your goodness that we will experience in the days to come. We ask that you would bless this. You'd bless this moment as we take and eat of your body. In Jesus' name, take and eat. Jesus commanded that we take the cup and the wine of his presence, that this was his new covenant, this was his blood that was going to make all things new. He said that his blood and this new covenant was going to bring us salvation and healing and deliverance. That this new covenant that we take today is a reminder of the victory that he has given to us. And it's a reminder to the enemy of his defeat. Jesus is victorious. And we share in his victory and his salvation by taking this cup today. And so, Father... Thank you for your new covenant. Thank you for your victory and your deliverance and your salvation. Thank you for causing us always to triumph. And fathers, we take this cup today. Would you ratify the covenant in our own hearts to you? I pray that this today would be a symbol of our intimate and ever-increasing relationship with you and the knowledge of who you are and for all that your blood has provided. As we take this cup today, Lord, we ask that you would turn the page and enter us into the new things that you have for us in this season. In Jesus' name. so holy, Jesus. You're so holy, God. You are worthy of all of our honor that we can give. You're worthy of all the praise that we can give. You're worthy of all the worship that we can give. Holy Spirit, I would just ask right now that you would give us insight and revelation to the things that we are to lay down and the things that we are to leave behind so that we can run with reckless abandonment into the fullness of who you are right now in our lives. 
that we would be free and no longer encumbered by the weightiness of past failures and past mistakes and, and all the things that we have gone through. We will receive the victory and the crown for the things that we have overcome, but we will not allow ourselves to be encumbered by the weightiness of the things that we may have tripped over. Father, I pray that you would give us feet that will scale over mountains, that you would give our hearts bravery and faith as we run into the presence that you have waiting for us now. And lastly, Lord, I pray for joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory, that this new season will be marked by joy joy, joy, rejoicing in joy. That you would strengthen us deep in our inner man with the joy of your spirit, God. Holy Spirit, we invite you now to come in in great measure that you would begin to work in us the will and the do of the Father's heart and that you would find in us an altar always prepared to lay ourselves down and to worship you and to get ourselves realigned with you so that we are found fit for the journey that you have for us. Cause us to be people who are strengthened in our inner man so that we can carry the weight of your presence the way that you long for us to. And as we do, that we would be carriers of that revival and that awakening spirit that you have within us and that we would begin to infect the world with your beauty in your presence, Lord. Do the work in us first that needs to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. He's so good, isn't he? I pray with all of my heart that you're encouraged in your faith today, that you've realigned your heart back with him, and that no matter what, as you go through the days that are ahead, that you know that you always have people here who will love you and will hold you and will help walk you through whatever it is that you're going through. Because we are not alone, beloved. We're in this together. So if you have something you need to lay down, you need to lay it down now. If you have something you need to walk over, you need to take a step and walk over it by faith right now. And don't go into the new the way you were in the old. Amen. I love you. If you have to go, we bless you. Go have fun with your families. Y'all have a beautiful New Year celebration. I'll see you next year. There's a praise that breaks the silence, a sound that slays the giants, a voice that breaks down every prison door. When we lift up our voices, praises go before us, for we know the battle is the love.
goes before me. Defender behind me. I won't be. Filled with a
make that the anthem of our heart. <laughs> Amen. Jesus, we love you, Lord. Just thank you for your presence this morning. I love a fresh kiss from Jesus. It's the best thing in the world. He's so good. Thank you guys today. Thank you. Well, personally, I'd stay here all day and worship and pray. That's just my jam. But other people have things to do. So we're going to close it out. If y'all can help us with the chairs. We're going to do all that. I love you. We will see you next Sunday. What day is that? What date is that? I don't even know what date that is. It's the 5th? Hey, there you go. Grace. Amen. It's a grace day. Amen. So we'll see you on the 5th. Y'all be safe. Y'all come see us at a fireworks stand near you. Jesus, I love y'all.